So next we are going to hear from what we what I like to call ask the experts panel. We're going to hear about good nutrition, physical therapy, and occupational therapy. And we have three experts in that field that are joining us today. And I'm going to introduce them real briefly, and then you will hear from them. Alicia Gilmore obtained her bachelor's and master's of science from Oklahoma State University. She is currently a clinical instructor for the Department of Clinical Nutrition in the School of Health and Profession Health Professions at University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. She teaches for the Clinical Nutrition Master's Program and also serves as a clinical um, preceptor at UTSW. She provides nutritional therapy for patients with ALS, MSA, PD, and other chronic diseases. And she has been a dietitian for over 20 years and is board certified specialist in oncology. Next, we will hear from Selena Morgan, who graduated from Texas A&M University with a BS in health education in 1984 at the University of Texas Health Science Center in Dallas, School of Physical Therapy in 86. She earned her doctor of physical therapy degree from the University of Texas Medical Branch in 2006. She is a board certified in neurological physical therapy and she has been actively involved with physical rehabilitation of patients with neurologically compromised and assistive technologies throughout her career. So thank you very much, Selena. And then the third person you'll hear from our panel is Dr. Autumn Clegg. She has been practicing occupational therapy for 17 years, and she's currently assist associate professor at UT Health San Antonio Occupational Therapy Program. Her clinical experience in adult neurorehabilitation. She is part of the UT Health San Antonio Department of Neuro Neurology team, serving patients with ALS. So thank you all for being here. And Alicia, I will let you go ahead and uh, present your slides. Thank you. Can you see my slides? Are they up? Okay. So thank you so much for uh, having me. Um, it's always fun to talk about my favorite topic, which is food. Um, so I kind of put together just a presentation of just common questions that um, my patients ask me um, with such a diverse audience. Um, I wanted just to kind of hit on the big picture um, and just keep in mind that these are general recommendations and that if you need more specifics, please consult your medical team. But this is probably the first question that um, ever comes up is what should I be eating? Um, and so usually I answer that with, well, that depends. <laughs> um, that depends on what your current diet looks like, um, your weight trends. You know, if you lost weight, then my recommendations might be different than if you, if you gain weight. Um, if you're having difficulty meeting your current nutrition needs, you know, then my recommendations would be different. And then if there's other factors that are going on, if there's other chronic diseases or anything else, um, then the recommendations would be different. Um, so, but I do tell all of my patients that we are what we eat. And if we eat good things, our bodies are going to work that much better. So what does that mean? Um, that does mean a variety of foods. Um, lean proteins, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and then dairy or dairy alternatives because of the calcium. And I'll, I'll go into some of these. Um, oh, if I were gonna, yes, ma'am. We we can't see your slides. I'm sharing. Let me try again. Is that better? <laughs> yes, that's perfect. All right. Look at all my pretty slides. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have two monitors, so sometimes I don't know what people can see and what can, they cannot. All right, let's go with this. Um, so we talked about depending. There's my macarons. All right, so we are what we eat. So when we eat good things, we are just going to, you know, work that much better. So like I said, we focus on variety of foods, the proteins, the fruits, the vegetables, the whole grains, the, the calcium foods. However, if I were gonna pick just a couple to talk about, I think one of the things I talk about most with my patients is protein. Um, a lot of times, some of my patients, you know, with some of the neurological diseases, um, lose their lean body mass. And so um, they say, well, you know, I'll just eat more protein to hold on to that. But I encourage my patients to choose adequate protein because um, more is not always better. You know, if we eat, more protein than what we need that can lead to overnutrition or what I like to call extra storage. 
So we, it's important to have enough. And why is the protein important? Well, it, you know, our body needs a certain amount of protein to repair cells. Um, it holds on to our lean muscle mass. Um, as we get older, we start to lose lean body mass, so making sure we're getting adequate protein to hold on to that. Our muscles, you know, as I mentioned, our organs, our hair, our eyes, our other body tissues are, are made up of protein. So we do need enough to, you know, keep these going. If we don't get enough, then our body is going to be resourceful and start looking for ways to, to meet the needs of it. And sometimes it does break down our muscles. And then anytime your body's growing or if it's repairing itself, you need protein. So you can see why it's an important nutrient in our diet. Um, good sources, lean cuts of meat, of pork loin, anything with the word loin in it, like a tenderloin, it's going to be a leaner cut of meat. And these are important because they're lower in saturated fat. Um, you know, we always have to look out for heart health too. So skinless chicken, turkey, and of course, fish and seafood, salmon, tuna, cod, those are our good omega-3 uh, fish shrimp, and then low fat or fat-free dairy foods, because of course we want to watch for the saturated fat as well. So foods like yogurt or milk or cheese, and then our great legumes like beans and lentils, um, soy, which are good sources of uh, vitamin E and fiber, and there are nuts and seeds as well, which also have the fiber and the vitamin E. So how much you know, protein do we need? Well, once again, that depends. <laughs> It depends on what your current activity level is, how old you are. As I mentioned, as we get older, we actually need a little more protein, and what our overall health is uh, right now. And for some of us, may need more protein than others, just depending on, on where we are. So it's good to kind of start with the RDA. And so this is just the recommended daily allowances, and you can see it varies um, through the years of age. But if we're going to look at, you know, one for example, a, a guy who's 19 to 30 years would need about six and a half ounces of protein. So what does that look like? So if you look at the palm of your hand, um, the palm of your hand is about three ounces. So this guy who's between 19 and 30 would need about two, two palmfuls of uh, protein every day. And if you think about it, we probably eat a lot more uh, then maybe two palmfuls or, or you know, uh, I was going to say three, but I don't see that on here. Usually we most Americans are, are not protein deficient. Um, the next uh, food group or the next uh, recommendation I talk to my patients about besides protein is calcium. And why is calcium important? Um, hopefully you know that calcium is related to bone health. Um, for those of my patients that may be on uh, steroids long term, that can affect their bone health, that can cause loss of bone mass, uh, it can increase the risk of fractures, um, and then I have some patients that may not be as active as they used to be and maybe not moving around as much, so that decrease in weight-bearing activity can also affect their bones, so that's why calcium um, is important, and so these are recommendations for calcium. Um, you can see for the most part it's about a thousand to um, 1300 milligrams of calcium a day. And so what does that look like? Well, the, the dairy group is probably the, the one that has the most foods that contain calcium. You can see yogurt, cheese, milk, uh, tofu, cottage cheese, all of those are considered good sources of calcium. But there's also other um, non-dairy, like uh, the fortified cereal. Not all cereals are fortified, but some of them are, and some of them actually do have all the calcium that you need. <laughs> um, also, fortified orange juice is another easy way uh, to get some good calcium in your diet. Now, you know, I have some patients that say, okay, you're telling me I need a thousand milligrams of calcium a day. How do I make that happen in my diet? Well, right now, the, this is a current food label. Um, and as you can see, you know, when we look at the serving size and we look at the calcium, the calcium for this product, whatever it is, is about 30%. Does anyone know what that means? Now you have to be a super sleuth to understand that and you have to actually know that the daily value for someone on a 2000 calorie diet for this particular label is 1300 milligrams. So then you have to do math and then you have to know that you know, 30% of 1,300 milligrams is almost about 400 milligrams. And yeah, I had to crunch, I had to use a calculator for that. 
Fortunately, you know, they took pity on us, and this is the new label. And you might see this new label on some products, but this old label still hangs around because they've allowed manufacturers to use up their old packaging before they move to the new, um, the new label. But you can see the new label has a nice little laid out calcium, 260 milligrams. So with this label, you'd want to look at the serving size and then the amount of calcium. So if you see, if you consumed all of whatever was in this package, you would have met your, your calcium needs. So fortunately, they've made it a lot easier for us to figure out if we need 1,200 milligrams of calcium a day, how we can read those food labels to, to figure out how that we meet our needs. But you know what's calcium without vitamin D? Of course, vitamin D promotes the calcium absorption, which is why you always see you know, calcium and vitamin D together. And that vitamin D is needed for bone growth and bone remodeling. And of course, without the vitamin D, brittle bones can occur. So these are just levels of vitamin D. This is something you want to talk to your doctor about if you're interested in knowing what your level of vitamin D. A lot of the physicians will draw them. Like, you know, if you have a GP or an internist, sometimes they'll draw it annually. Um, but usually just the, rec the goal that we're looking for is over 20 nanograms. Sometimes I put it in animals, or I've seen it most often in nanograms. Um, and then they're still trying to understand what it means if you have really high levels of vitamin D. I think the research on vitamin D is really interesting and it's still, uh, you know, they're still looking at, at what that means. But of course, if you're interested in knowing your, your level of vitamin D, talk to your doctor. So these are just the daily required intake for vitamin D. You can see, you know, they're not hugely high. And actually they reformulated these maybe about five or 10 years ago. It used to be 400 international units and then they met and they came to understanding that now it's about 600 international units of um, vitamin D. So how do we get this in our diet? Well, as you can see from the chart, just one easy tablespoon of cod liver oil could meet your needs. Anyone interested in that? Yeah, me neither. <laughs> um, but you can see you can also meet your vitamin D needs through salmon or, or swordfish. But those are really the ones that are probably the highest sources of dietary vitamin D. And then everything else is a lot smaller. So a lot of people find that they do have to supplement with, um, with vitamin D supplementation. Of course, that's um, a question for your physician to find out if that's something appropriate for you. So, but as we all know, Eating is a balancing act. Sometimes we err on the side of overnutrition, and you know maybe sometimes our intake exceeds our needs. Um, maybe because of free will, because you know Chewy's is just that good with the chips and the jalapeno ranch. <laughs> um, sometimes certain medications will cause an increase in appetite and have us eat a little bit more than we need. Sometimes we're not moving it around as much as we used to. Um, but we haven't adjusted our intake to reflect our, our energy needs and we have decreased activity. So sometimes that can cause uh, a little bit overnutrition. So, you know, what do we do about that? Well, we have to watch what we eat. But I think it's important, you know, for some of my patients to be mindful of this because if you lose weight too fast, it can actually cause a loss of lean body mass. And that's what we know from, you know, talking earlier about protein is important to retain. So I usually do talk to my patients more about focusing on what kinds of foods that we should have in our diet every day. If you're looking for specifics, you know, you do have access to a dietitian. They can um, work with you and discuss, you know, certain recommendations for you. But if you don't have access to a dietitian, then I like using um, my plate. So this is something uh, from the USDA called Choose My Plate. And it, it's nice and easy peasy. Um, they have a calculation on their uh, website. You can enter your age, your sex, your weight, your height, your activity level, and then it can calculate a, an easy peasy food plan for you. Um, but if you're not as mobile, if you don't move around as much, um, you might find that your energy needs are less. And so if you are um, probably not active, then your energy needs are probably about 70 to 80% of this predicted calculation. So you will have to do a little bit of number crunching. So, but this is just kind of an example of a plan um, on their website. And um, I like it because again, it says focus on these foods and just make sure that these foods are in your diet every day. So one and a half cups of fruit. So, and that's focusing on the whole fruits because you get all that good fiber and those good antioxidants and phytonutrients. And the same with your, um, your veggies. 
Um, and the fruits and vegetables is important to have a variety because they all offer something different. So your dark green, your orange, your red, offer different kinds of nutrients. Uh, making sure that you're getting adequate grains, that your grains are whole grains because they do have the natural B vitamins in the vitamin E, which are, are good for our heart. We talked about protein already and then the dairy in order to get the calcium. You see on the bottom, you know, that doesn't say, you know, don't drink sodas or don't eat cake or things like that, but it does want you to limit your sugar intake to about 45 grams. And with the um, new uh, food label, it actually will differentiate what is considered added sugar. So that's very nice. And then of course, watching your sodium intake and saturated fat. Um, I like this because I think it also encourages us to not choose foods out of bags and boxes, but really to make sure that you're shopping more the perimeter of the food as far as the dairy and the fruits and the veggies and the, the lean proteins, the perimeter of the grocery store, not going in and getting things that are in those um, bags and boxes. So, you know, on the flip side, sometimes my patients have difficulty meeting their nutrition needs. Constipation is a, a big deal. Uh, you know, if you feel full, you don't really feel like eating, and that can keep you from eating as much. Uh, maybe you're not able to meet your nutrition needs. Um, maybe you have increased energy needs. Some of these neurological diseases will sometimes just your energy needs will pop up, and um, you're not eating as much as you need to, and that can cause some weight loss. Uh, maybe you've had just dis uh, decreased muscle strength, so um, you're having more difficulty swallowing, difficulty chewing. Um, sometimes difficulty chewing can make meal times last longer. You know, I have a lot of patients that will tell me, you know, I'm still eating, you know, my, everyone's done, and then they'll just kind of stop because they feel bad. Um, so, or they get tired, and so that can affect how much they're able to eat. So then I have some patients that are dependent on others to feed them, and some of my patients will just stop eating because they, they feel like they're, they're bothering or they're, you know, being a problem. So that can also affect how much they're able to eat and maybe keep them from e meeting their nutrition needs. So let's talk about some strategies. So constipation, you know, uh, I have some patients and you know, my first thing is when they tell me they're having difficulty with constipation, I'll say, well, how much fluid are they drinking? And they always tell me, well, not enough, Alicia. So that's kind of where I first started, making sure that they're drinking enough fluids. And for an adult, about 64 to 80 ounces a day. Sometimes hot beverages uh, can get things moving as well. Sometimes adding prunes or prune juice or, or plum juice. Um, plum juice is actually quite tasty, so I, I warn you, drink it with caution. <laughs> um, you know, increasing fiber in your diet, getting those fruits, those vegetables, those whole grains, you know, the legumes. Um, there's something that you can make called power pudding, and it's a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio of bran, applesauce, and student prunes or, or prune juice. And then you blend it all up and then you can actually put it in an ice cube tray and throw it in the freezer and start with like one serving a day and then gradually increase as needed. And sometimes that can get things moving as well. Um, bulking agents like bran or flaxseed, wheat germ, methyl cellulose, which cannot be as gassy. Um, there's some supplements out there. There's one called Smooth Move Tea. There's probiotic. Um, just keep in mind that supplements are not regulated by the government. So if you choose, if you do choose supplements, you want to make sure you go with a, a good brand. And then if you've done everything, if you're doing the fluids, you're doing the fiber, you're doing all of that, and, and things still aren't moving, of course, you want to talk to your healthcare team about other things that you can be doing uh, to help resolve that constipation because that's just not fun. Um, strategies for increasing intake. Um, of course, I always start out with, well, tell me, you know, what you're eating, how much you're eating. Oh, you're eating one meal a day. Okay, well, let's maybe, you know, increase that. Or, okay, you're eating three small meals. Well, let's add some snacks between the meals to see if that's helpful. Or, hey, when you do eat, let's, you know, make sure we have good calorie protein dense foods and we're choosing those first. So if you're tired, you know, you've left the vegetables, but at least you've got the good protein or the good salmon or something like that. If you're having difficulty chewing or if you're having difficulty swallowing, you can modify your diet, you can chop it, you know, using one of those like little hand chops, you know, the made for television commercial. Sometimes those little hand chops can help chop things up really easily. Um, having things blended, pureed. If you've met with a speech therapist and it's recommended that you are on thick and liquids, you know, that can help as well. You know, watch out for certain foods if you're having difficulty swallowing, you know, like lettuce, watermelon, which weirdly is a, a mixed consist 
in seafood. It's a solid and a liquid. And sometimes our body gets confused about how we're supposed to, how we're supposed to swallow it. Uh, rice, you know, some soups, again, the mixed texture. Sometimes I, we lean on liquid nutrition. You know, if you're having more difficulty meeting your needs because you're tired of chewing or you don't have an appetite, sometimes we can squeeze in those extra calories by doing shakes or, or smoothies. Um, but then sometimes, you know, we've done everything that we can and we're still not meeting our, our nutrition needs. And so that's when, you know, I'll, I will start talking to my patients about um, nutrition support um, or more specifically a, a feeding tube. Um, and usually when I start talking to my patients about a feeding tube, they tell me, I don't want to talk about it. And then I always say, well, I think it's important for you to know what you're saying no to and that you're making an informed decision. So, you know, nutrition support, it can be used to provide partial or 100% nutrition. I have patients that still eat. And then they supplement their diet with, you know, one or two or three cans of food, just depending on how they eat. It's an easy way to get fluids, you know, if you're having difficulty swallowing fluid, but you're still okay with like meatloaf and mashed potatoes, and you can use it for your hydration needs. Um, you can use it for medications that can be crushed or for liquid medications. And it can also be a stress reliever. Um, you know, we know in our, we know how important nutrition is. We know it makes our body go. And if we're not getting the nutrition that we need, you know, it's stressful and we know we don't feel as good and we know our families get worried. So sometimes having that different avenue um, for nutrition can just kind of relieve that. So this is what it looks like. Some of my patients know what they look like. Some of my patients do not. So usually it's a feeding tube that goes in the stomach. This is an example of also of one that goes past the stomach into the jejunum, but most often my patients get the one that go into the stomach. And this is just kind of what it looks like as you feed. Um, the next question is what, what do I put in it? There's lots of different kinds of what we call two feed. Um, there's some that, you know, you can blend your own. There's some that come like foods blended, like there's egg and oatmeal and there's like salmon and I forgot what all the other flavors, turkey and sweet potatoes. There's some that are vegan. There's some that are organic and there's some that are really traditional. Um, there's some that are low allergy. So there's lots of different kinds of brands. Um, and types of tube feeding, but all of them have the vitamins and the minerals and the protein and the carbohydrates and everything that you need to keep your body strong and, and give you the energy to do what you want to do. So there's different avenues of how you can feed yourself. Most typical is what we call a bolus feed or a syringe feed, and it's just you put the nutrition in the syringe and you put it through the tube. Um, this is something that's called a bully bag, and I have to say my patients are my best teachers. Um, you know, if some of my patients are having difficulty with the fine motor uh, skills, this is, you know, instead of having to hold a syringe like this, they can hold the bag and they can feed themselves that way. This is something called a gravity bag, and it's, uh, you pour the nutrition in the bag, and this is on a pole, and then you have a fun little roller clamp that can make it go fast or make the food go slower. Um, and so this is also helpful if you, you're unable to hold things very well, then you can just pour the nutrition in there and they'll allow that go through. And then the last is a, a more traditional route of feeding with a pump, and that's a certain amount that's um, provided over an hour. And sometimes my patients will use these for nocturnal feeds. So nutrition support can help if you're having, you know, aspiration issues, you know, food's not going down the right way, you know, we want to keep you safe and keep you well. And so that's where, you know, feeding tube may be helpful for that. If meals are starting to tar start to take longer than 30 minutes to, to chew, um, it might be something to start thinking about. Of course, there's lots of other reasons of, of this, but this is just kind of one of the things that I, I, I look at. If you've lost weight and you're unable to put the weight back and we've tried all the different strategies and maybe this is something. And of course, if you're just unable to meet your nutrition needs. Um, and of course, you know, there's always if, ands, buts, and whys, and everyone is very different, but this is just general, general information. Um, and of course, you always want to discuss what your wants are and what your needs are with your medical team and your family. So that's all I have for now. It's hard to squish all of my knowledge in 20 minutes, but um, I look forward to uh, what questions you have at the end of this. Thank you. Well, that was really, really helpful. I, uh, as far as nutrition goes, I feel like I needed that on a personal level myself. But um, I'm a physical therapist, and I've been doing my job for about 34 years now. And um, I, everything has been neurologically trained as far as everything I've ever done. But 
I've had the privilege of being able to be in the Muscular Dystrophy Association Clinic that UT Health has here in San Antonio. And it's a good multidisciplinary team effort. And so what I'm gonna do with these next few slides is kind of outline my job and how I can help people in the clinical setting as well as when they actually come and they get re referred to me as um, having a physical therapy order and see them on a regular basis, not just in the clinical uh, screening type setting. And so I feel like the objectives that I wanna get across today and make sure that I cover is that it's, it's one thing to uh, be prescribed exercise but it's another thing to know what your response is to exercise based on the type of muscular dystrophy or any neuromuscular uh, disorder that you may be having and what the stages you are in and uh, is exercise indicated and how much and what can a PT do? I think people see us as boot camp instructors and um, we're actually very careful about how we prescribe exercise and how we dose it and that's what I wanna get across today. And then um, also developing exercise goals. Um, I, I see a lot of kids too, but I was told to focus on adults today. Um, so what we do to test our patients as a whole, what, no, at any age, what their exercises responses, what their exercise responses are, and any kind of safety precautions based on diagnosis and response to the exercise that we keep in mind to make sure that everybody's safe in doing so and that they become directors of their own programs as well. So exercise in MD as a whole is, has been controversial in the past, and it's not as much as, as, as before. In fact, in my, early in my career, I hardly saw anyone with a neuromuscular disease at all. And I found this article for, and that was um, published in 2013. It's a systematic review, it holds a lot of weight. And I feel like it uh, summarizes kind of where our world is today with exercise. Um, of course, we know that exercise, it, it summarizes all of this, that it's beneficial, um, but it must be cautious to avoid detrimental effects. And so we all kind of are aware of that. Um, but it examined the most uh, recent data up to 2013. And of course, we know it improves bone density because we're bearing weight um, and we're um, contracting muscles that pull on muscle on bone and, and allow bone density to occur. So we have healthy bones, good flexibility of our muscles and strength, of course, and there's a lot, of, a lot more benefits, but these are the top three that the study looked at. And then mood, we just talked about how important our psychiatric health is toward our physical health and vice versa. And I, I just loved that talk as well. Um, but from my point of view, I feel very obligated to make sure that the person that's in front of me and their family understands that we're looking at functional capacity so that even if it's compensated or adapted, including respiratory care, physical care, everything, cardiopulmonary, health, uh, deformity management, all those things, that we create a functional capacity that allows participation um, and mobility. Without those two big things, uh, there's uh, a lot of secondary effects that we have to deal with. And if we can nip it in the bud from the beginning, uh, people are able to work longer, walk longer, move around longer, participate longer, and have better mental health because of it. So it's the whole person, like we've said earlier in today's talks. Uh, but we do a lot of mobility training as well, even if it's compensated. So when I say compensated, we talk, what I'm trying to say is that whether it be with a walker or braces or assisted in some level, um, we try to promote as much independence as possible. And if that means prescribing a cane or something to keep a person safe and well balanced and avoid falls, um, then that's what we need to do. I don't like to do anything without my patient's consent. If they're not bought in to something I think is important, they're just not gonna do it. And so my job is the education portion of it and to make sure that the understanding of the consequences of, of not staying safe could be um, an accessibility, of course. Uh, one of the biggest things in my world has been you know, since 1986 when I became a PT is no matter what the diagnosis is, accessibility is huge. It, it's being able to walk into a building and get into a bathroom and 
attend a concert and all those kinds of things. So I look at it from that perspective as well as part of my job. Um, we have to understand pathophysiology and the stages of the different diseases. And I, again, we don't have the full list and each one of these diseases I feel has its own variances and its own presentations based on the human. And so I think we have to really not just understand the disease and what stages a person may be in, but that person's entire profile, whether they're diabetic, like we talked about, whether there's cardiopulm issues, whether there's uh, genetic issues that are not yet understood. I've had patients undiagnosed for six or seven years before we actually knew what they had. And then, and then even if it's a rare disease, what do we know about that rare disease and how it responds to the different therapeutic techniques that we have, functional electrical stimulation, dry needling to help muscle spasms, elect, um, all kinds of things, all the uh, resistive exercises and, and what the tolerance is to that and uh, fitness uh, promotion through aerobic activities, those kinds of things. We have to really be mindful of all that. Now this gentleman here, um, he, he looks great. Um, as a clinician, I think about, um, you know, his, what he's sitting on and in. And I, I love that I see him and not really his chair. I notice there's padding in different places, so I know he needs his arms. And I know that he's a little shifted at the trunk to the right with his neck to the left, so I suspect some scoliosis. So when people come into clinic, I try to pick up on little things like that and start addressing the more practical needs so that whoever the person may be are immediately more comfortable, that the immediate more urgent needs are met. And then we start delving into how can we make you stronger, a little bit more fit, and reduce the secondary effects of whatever disease is going on. And so the question is, I teach at the physical therapy school here at UT Health in San Antonio, and this is what my students want to know is how, what are the goals? Uh, how, what happens if we do nothing? Uh, how, how do we treat patients that have a degenerative disorder, for example? And um, for a long time, insurance didn't cover um, care that was to maintain in any way. And now they do. You just have to be careful how you explain it and, and be truthful, of course. But if we do nothing, what are the secondary effects? What are we preventing? I always tell my students, don't say prevent. We reduce the risk of. <laughs> if you say prevent, they think it's just um, care that shouldn't be covered. And um, insurance can be a real big deal breaker when, the, when people really need something. So the things I think about is, um, if we do nothing, there's a reduction in functioning overall. Degenerative changes happen sooner than later. They lose their jobs sooner than later. Uh, disabilities happen sooner than later. Um, being able to parent um, from a physical standpoint becomes a little bit more difficult sooner than later. Uh, cardio, respiratory strength, endurance as a whole, uh, tolerance to mobility strategies, staying on your feet longer. So it's quality of life. And quality of life, uh, if you use outcome measures with that, if a person is physically active in whatever capacity they're capable of, quality of life improves drastically. And, and so when we're talking about the whole patient, that's what we mean. So when I worry about exercise with my patients, there, there's a couple of things is, um, we usually start, and the physicians that send us patients have guided us with this, um, we want to dose the exercise carefully. We usually start at 70% of maximum heart rate. A really easy formula is the number 220 minus the person's age, and then you take 0.7 or 70% of that number, and that's the heart rate that we should be working at as a starting point. Sometimes our physicians say, you know, their cardiac's not real great. Let's start at 50. 50 is almost at rest, and so it's really a low number but at least we have a baseline. We can see what people can tolerate over time. I'm not interested in pushing people to their limits every single time. I monitor their heart rate. I teach them to monitor their own heart rate. I monitor oxygen saturation in their blood and teach them to do that. It's real easy to get a little saturation monitor from CVS Pharmacy or Walgreens or someplace like that. Um, exercise tolerance and stamina is highly dependent on barriers related to respiratory health. I teach them deep breathing exercises. I teach families to assist or dependently cough 
someone who can't cough effectively so that they're able to clear their lungs and they drink plenty of fluids. Speaking of nutrition, if you've got plenty of fluids, you're gonna have better urinary tract health. You're gonna have uh, thinner liquids, thinner secretions in your lungs. Your bowels will move better. And so all we, we think a lot about making sure they're well hydrated. Muscle performance also improves with um, nutrition and with plenty of fluids but we spend a lot of time on strength and flexibility. And it may mean really low intensity exercise. It may mean good stretching routine and training families to do that and to maintain good joint integrity with good range of motion and, and pain-free ranges and increasing those pain-free ranges. And so there's a whole lot of family training surrounding this, but we are carefully introducing all of these exercises to make sure that they can function well at home and at their jobs and at school. Um, we focus on outcomes after each session. So how, how did it go today? I always ask, you know, what do you think you did well today? What do you think was too much? What do you think was not enough? Or is that, I always say it's a trick question, was that too easy? And they laugh and they go, oh, you'll make it hard on me if I answer uh, positively that way. But I, I have them keep a um, calendar, kind of a journal, and I think it's really important to do this because everyone is so incredibly different. If it was too much, uh, we write down what they did that day in therapy and what they did at home and how sore were they or how much cramping did they experience or how much spasticity did they experience or extreme fatigue where they can't get out of bed the following day or the second day after exercise because sometimes there's a delayed fatigue that they experience and delayed consequences. So they keep this calendar and they, we decide together what's too much and what's not enough. And that helps them really self-regulate and be more aware. I like what someone said earlier, they take inventory every day to see where they are and what they can do to get better. And so it's really patient driven. Um, MMT is manual muscle testing. When we evaluate, we're taught to apply resistance to change the person's position whether it's against gravity or gravity eliminated and we make judgments on strength and we give it a number and we've always thought that was a little bit subjective but you know in a professional judgment kind of way but we use myometers quite a bit to monitor strength it gives us a number in kilos that helps us really understand what a person's strength is but we need to do that in reps because they might have a certain number in the first one or two or three reps but by the 10th rep, their strength decays. And I wanna make sure that we know what that is so we can measure the exercise that we do. And then eccentric control, that's not just a muscle shortening, which is concentric to move a joint. The eccentric is controlled elongation. It's like what your quads feel when you're holding a squat. And a lot of my patients don't have that kind of muscle power or they struggle to obtain that and they lose it fairly easily. So we spend time in understanding what our limits are because if you flex at the knees or go into a lunge to pick something up off the floor, that could be a reason that you fall. So understanding yourself and what your capabilities are in terms of what your muscles can tolerate, what your balance can tolerate, what sensory systems are in play, all of that is part of what physical therapy does in any given session so that the person dealing with this has a good self-knowledge of what their strengths and weaknesses are and then you can operate in a safer environment you can operate longer and so we also ask perceived exertion questions uh, how do you think how tired you are right now was that a 10 was that a we can go up to 20 it depends on the scale that you use but it gives us an idea of how they feel with any given exercise. So, and then we put that in the same log. Um, we also really think about distributed exercise where we're not doing so much in a short amount of time, but we feel like we're more productive if we separate the exercises out and have distributed exercise rather than mass exercise. Signs of muscle damage are one of our biggest precautions and when we think exercise is not indicated at that given point, it, um, I kind of feel that we never really give up on exercise, we just measure it. And we, uh, it, there's a point at where exercise becomes a little bit more passive, where a caregiver is helping more than the person's being able to help. But even stretching exercise is exercise and is, is 
all for the goal of well-being. So, but if we are exercising and the person's actually doing all the exerting themselves, I look for signs of muscle damage. Um, signs might be excessive muscle cramping, and so I need to know their baseline because I need to know if this is more than usual. And so if their muscle pain is beyond baseline, if there's regressive weakness compared to their baseline, so I'm losing those strength grades I talked about, or if they start to have muscle destruction as we see when they ask to go to the bathroom, I go help them do their uh, bathroom and toileting tasks and I see that there's dark urine or they report dark urine in, after exercise and I know that there's muscle destruction going on and it's too much. Um, I do have athletes that end up um, trying to do more than I'm prescribing them and these are some of the consequences they show up with because they're not following a careful routine. Um, signs of cardiac distress or shortness of breath, that's what SOB is angina, which is chest pain, acute onset of weakness. Uh, I especially see this with, my, with myasthenia. We really help them learn what, what is too much for them. Sometimes there's nausea, sometimes any kind of adverse sign or symptom, I feel like it's a chance to stop and rest and think about what our next move is gonna be. Autonomic signs, which is the fight or flight response uh, that uh, the doctor was talking about earlier, but autonomic signs also give us a red flag. If there's too much sweating, tachycardia, they're kind of where their, or their uh, beats per minute cardiac heart rate is too high between, between 150 and 160 is considered tachycardia. But again, you have to know their baseline. If their baseline is already fairly high and I stress them too much, then I'm already too close to their boundary. Uh, but I look for um, clammy skin, sweating, tachycardia, uh, feeling that they, they could pass out, things like that. I look for things that, that is becoming too much of a stressor for them. So I stop the exercise, we rest, and we make decisions as to if we should continue that same day or if we should tailor their program in the following sessions. When I feel like we're at a point where they understand their exercise program, we reduce the therapy sessions, um, the frequency of them instead of twice a week or whatever. We go down to once a week or once every other week, or we might go ahead and discharge once I know my patient is independent with self-monitoring and that they're safe. And also if I know they're gonna be seen in clinic upcoming and we can have an interdisciplinary team check everything. Respiratory health is a big part of uh, what PTs do. A lot of folks don't understand our, our, that we're have respiratory training, certainly not to the degree as a certified respiratory therapist, but our history comes from the polio epidemic. And so uh, we've been trained for years uh, to help with assist cough, to identify what paradoxical breathing is, which is the, the top picture, it's the sketch, uh, where instead of the chest rising, the belly rises instead, and you just don't get a nice big chest expansion for breathing. And so we do a lot of rib cage stretching, we do prone positioning, which is laying on your belly. And if you can tolerate it up on your elbows, laying on your belly, really stretches the intercostal uh, costal muscles and stretches your hips. If you sit too much, it'll help with that. And we make sure the rib cage is nice and supple and moving freely. And not only does that help you with breathing, but it also help you receive a good assist cough to clear your secretions and clear your airway. And so uh, we train families to do all of these things. We train you to self-assist cough. We pay a whole lot of attention to wheelchair positioning. If you're a person that needs a wheelchair, uh, it tends to be a power chair for efficiency as well as uh, for energy conservation and to protect your musculature. But wheelchair positioning, if you're in a clinic and you don't have a clinician that's there that understands or a wheelchair vendor that's clinically trained, to look at your position, to look at your skin, to make sure that your pelvis is level and that your shoulder girdle is level and that you're sitting in a little degree of tilt or recline to help you fight gravity, then you're gonna fall into scoliosis and poor positioning and have skin issues, breathing issues, digestive issues and deformity that could start to happen. And the, all of that is preventable. And so I, I have an assistive technology certification that I've had for years and I feel like that has taught me more about uh, this area than anything else I've ever learned in school. And I feel like 
if, if I can have my tool bag in clinic and make adjustments right then and there, get the vendor in right away, then my patients are much better off. And those are those quick, immediate, urgent things that make a person comfortable immediately and less fatigued immediately. We teach deep breathing exercises, not only inhalation, but also exhalation. And we were very alert to aspiration risks and certainly get the speech pathologist involved, which same thing as a speech therapist. They just like to be called speech pathologists, and I appreciate that very much. My sister's a speech pathologist, and she corrects me all the time. Um, but we monitor for changes in this breathing pattern so that sometimes the breathing pattern improves just because the wheelchair position has improved. And so that it's very life conserving and life-changing to have a proper fitted wheelchair. I always feel like it's a, one of my favorite uh, wheelchair positioning persons is an OT named Karen Kangas. And she, she said one day that the, the wrong wheelchair, the wrong seating and positioning is like the wrong medication. It could kill you. And I, I thought she was just being elaborate at that time. But over the years, I have seen that that is completely true. So assistive technology, which I know Dr. Clegg is gonna get into, is very life-saving as well. When we talk about ambulation, which in terms of that term, is I really mean walking. You can ambulate in different ways, you can mobilize in different ways, but what I mean is walking and fall risk. And so I look, I do a full gait analysis in clinic and in, and in the therapy gym when I have a patient and we try to de- I try to decide what's causing the falls, if there are falls. Not only if the person's falling, if they are, I wanna know if they are able to get up and what the strategies are there, and then I'm training the family that way as well. I wanna address weaknesses, correct deformities, restore the movement of center of gravity as they move. Sometimes stability means braces, so little AFOs, and there's different kinds, and if you get the wrong AFO prescription, you end up thinking you hate an AFO. I can't stand those. I feel it. I can't stand it. All my patients who don't have sensation love their AFOs, but people with sensation tend to not like them very much, and they're in the closet or in the trunk of their car. And I think there's there's a lot to be said to spending time fitting those and making sure that they are comfortable so that they do become your best friend so that you can restore stability when you're up walking and allow yourself to walk a much much longer and reduce your fall risk and have propulsive energy within the braces so that you're not so exhausted when you're walking as well. Um, Most of my patients have problems with sensory integration meaning they don't they don't either have the feel of the ground or they are good visual cues or inner ear cues and between those three I always say eyes ears and feet Those need to interplay properly in PT, and I know OT can differentiate what might be going on and do some therapy based on inner ear dysfunction or feel of the ground dysfunction to kind of help with balance retraining. And then LRAD is least restrictive assistive device. We want the person to have, I think less is more. It's more energy conserving to have a lesser assistive device for walking. If you need more, then we do more but it's the least restrictive is what we're, our goal always is. And then we're, our goal is to make proper referrals to the, our, our team members to make sure. And there's a video reference here that kind of helps you see before and after AFOs. And then we always look at balance gait analysis, like I said, uh, the history of falls is the number one reason that PTs get referrals. Um, but we always find that there's way more to take care of than just balance in falls. Uh, Wheeled mobility, like I said, is a subspecialty of what we do, and it can be PT or OT. It just depends on who feels ready and trained for that. We often do that together. Um, Both of these boys have great positioning, or at least the best that they can tolerate. And even with our best efforts, the young man on the right, who's one of my favorite humans, still has deformities of his feet that uh, got away from us no matter what we did. And so even with our best efforts, sometimes we don't get the best outcome, but we get their best outcome. And so I used to beat myself up quite a bit if I wasn't solving every problem, but certainly that's always our goal. And sometimes uh, we just do our best. And I think as a patient speaking to the patients out there in the audience, just do your best. And any decision you make is the right decision for you, I would say. 
We address pain quite a bit that comes from the different areas that you see here. It could be muscle pain, it could be pain from spasms and cramping, which is different pain than the pain we get from spasticity. And then sometimes it's postural pain. And so we ask very specifically what type of pain we, we dig into what we can do to change that so that your life is better. Um, the take home message really is promote is to promote health and wellness. I think I, I love I'm loving this conference because I think we're hitting it from all the different angles and you see it listed there. Um, and we're just part of the team to help promote health and wellness as long and as, as possible with only the person in mind. And so when I think about who's the expert on the panel, the experts, the person living with this, with any disease, the person that's the expert is uh, the family members who know what they need. And so we're experts in our individual fields, but when you look at the team approach and family-centered care, it's the families and the person dealing with it directly who's the expert. So you need to tell us how to treat you. Here's my references. And that's it. So um, thank you guys again for the patience. And um, I'm really gonna talk from an occupational therapy standpoint on the adaptive equipment for activities of daily living. So that's gonna be my focus on this for time's sake. And so just as a disclaimer, um, I'm gonna be showing lots of pictures and products and some websites listed and resources included in the presentation. They're not endorsed by myself. I do not make any money off of them whatsoever, but I do want to share resources and things that I have learned um, from my years of experience as an OT, as well as a lot I've learned from patients and families. And then again, it's just really to offer resources to those out there. So what is occupational therapy? We are a profession that helps people across the lifespans do the things that they want and need to do. So our occupation are the things that occupy our time. And so occupational therapists are licensed healthcare professionals who focus on individuals' ability to participate in activities that are important and meaningful to them. So that's gonna be different for every single person. I may find um, meaning in painting and flowers where Selena finds meaning in other leisure activities. And so some of what OT can address is here listed on the screen from activities of daily living or our self-care task. Um, leisure activities, cooking, focus on adaptive equipment, as well as the others you see listed. And so for, like I said, the sake of this, we're going to be talking about adaptive equipment, focusing on activities of daily living. So um, my focus as an OT really is to look at energy conservation, fatigue management to maximize function and always being client centered to engage that person in their valued roles and their valued occupations and always anticipating and planning for future needs, whether it's because of the neuromuscular um, disease or because of aging um, or anything in between and always looking at um, safety as well. So jumping right into it, looking at eating, um, if there's weakness or something in the hands where it's gonna be harder to hold utensils, something that's smaller is harder to hold on to than if you make it larger. So um, here in the picture, if you have a built up utensil or this foam that you can put on a regular spoon or fork or toothbrush or pencil, and you just cut off the size that you need um, and put it right on there, but it makes it bigger and easier to hold on to. Um, this down here is a rocker knife. So instead of a more traditional way of cutting, um, it's more of a gross grasp and you rock it back and forth. It it's, you know, takes some of that fine motor skills out of things. Looking at, um, this is a scoop plate. So it has a little edge here. So if you're scooping things out, the food's not falling onto the table or there's a plate guard that can go around um, a traditional plate that you like using. A universal cuff is pictured here and this has a D ring back here. And it just Velcros on and it has a little slit that you can put a fork or a spoon or a toothbrush, like I said, but you can truly, once that's on there, because it's Velcroed on, you can hold your hand completely open. So you're not having to hold on to that utensil the entire time you're feeding yourself if your hands tend to get tired. 
And then if your wrists are a little bit weaker and want to drop down, um, there's some wrist support here that then also has a universal cuff. So again, we're just finding ways to make things a little bit easier. Um, cups with handles over here, instead of holding a cup traditionally like this, which is more fatiguing, if you slide your hand into it, it doesn't take as much energy over on your hand over um, the period of time. And so it's, it's easier on everybody to do those type of things. And just some tips and tricks I've learned. Um, you know, we're always told to not put our elbows on the table, but if you support your elbow on the table, it's gonna um, be easier. You're not having to use all the muscles in your whole arm if that's supported to just, again, fatigue. Raising up a surface by putting um, a bed tray or a box. Um, this person's husband built this for her, so you can tell it just raises it up. There's a place to put her arm because it's going to be easier to do this to bring food to your mouth rather than going from the lower table all the way up. It takes less energy and hopefully then you'll um, enjoy your meal more, um, get more of that nutrition that we were talking about earlier and um, it helps overall. Um, Dyson is a blue non-stick material that you can get from different um, places that have medical equipment that you put under a plate or a bowl or a cup and it keeps it from sliding. But you can also just go to any box, big box store, Walmart, Target, Home Depot, Lowe's, all have this non-slip shelf liner that works the same way. It just keeps that um, from sliding. Again, just these little tips and tricks to help um, conserve some energy and make it a little bit easier. That is our goal. And then into the assistive technology realm, there is then high tech, um, of course, with that comes more um, cost, but there are here three different devices that are more of a robotic automatic feeder that you hit a switch and it scoops the food and brings it up to your mouth. I personally only have experience with the OBI robotic feeding device, this one here on the right, because I do have a couple of patients that have this. They are pretty expensive. Um, between the three of these, they range between $4,000 and $7,000, and typically insurance does not cover that. So that is um, another thing to consider. I just wanted to do a quick demonstration of the OBI. So he is hitting a switch and it tells him then which bowl he wants food out of. And then the other switch when he hits it tells it to take a scoop. Um, there are, you know, considerations to take with this, the side, the size and consistency of the food. And um, so like mashed potatoes or something that mushed together or a lot harder for it to scoop than something say that like the things he's eating here a, a breakfast bowl and grapes and so those are all things to take into consideration this was really important for him because his wife was feeding himself but she would eat first and then feed him or she would feed him and then eat later and they weren't enjoying the meals together so this was really important for him to have to be able to eat at the same time as his wife Again, it's always client-centered. Moving into grooming and adaptive equipment, um, the things that are gonna help you and do the work for you, like an electric toothbrush, an electric razor, the water pick flosser, are all gonna, you know, they have a bigger handle, so it's gonna be easier to hold on to. But then the electric part of it does that more of the work for you. So you don't have to, you know, move your arm as much to brush your teeth or to shave. Um, it's doing it for you. This long handled comb or brush so you don't have to raise your arm all the way up to brush your hair. You can um, do it like that. If um, the fine motor pinching is a little bit harder, there's nail care options that it is stuck to a board and then you're truly just pushing down and more in a gross function. Um, if your arm gets tired drying your hair, there's hair dryer stands um, and then um, bathing and washing hair is one of the more fatiguing options and so this is just a washing tray that somebody can then go at the sink or a pool to um, inflate a pool bowl that can be used in bed or also at the sink um, for somebody to help maybe if you're taking a shower every other day or every third day because of energy conservation. 
going into bathing and toileting, definitely um, there's lots of durable medical equipment like shower chairs, tub benches, rolling chairs. Um, if you're sitting down to shower, it's gonna save energy. And they mentioned earlier, you know, then you can focus on just taking a shower and your mind's not having to think about everything else that's going on in the world, but, um, and safety, but you're truly just sitting down and enjoying your shower a little bit more. Um, Three-in-one commodes or elevated toilet seats for shower chairs if the trunk or neck's weaker, if you can tilt back into space like this picture, um, it's gonna be providing more support. It makes it easier um, on the person and the caregiver. For toileting, you know, that is one of the more personal um, tasks that we do, and some people really don't want a caregiver or family member helping out with that. Um, so this is a freedom wand. It is like a long handled tool that is four tools in one. So it has a toilet aid um, to help wipe, a long handled sponge, um, makes it longer so you can shave and not have to bend over for safety and then um, have to talk to Selena with falls. Um, another option for toileting is usually a bidet or a washlet. So washlets are um, like a bidet that attaches to your toilet. Um, they, you know, bidets and washlets range from, you know, low options, lower cost to um, very fancy and more expensive. But my patients that have bidets absolutely love them and so do their families. So it's not just the patient using them, but the whole family ends up um, really taking advantage of having a bidet. Um, having a urinal, so you're not having to get up at night and go all the way into the bathroom if you're having to transfer to a wheelchair. And there are female urinals. They're not quite as easy to use um, as the ones for men are, but they are out, out there. And then condom catheters, kind of the same idea, um, a lot easier for men, but there is, um, in the last couple of years, there now is one that's a female external catheter. Um, it is a little bit more expensive and also has to be attached to a suction. So there's a lot more involved. And I personally don't have know anybody that has used it, but I know it's out there. So again, just wanted to provide the resources. Um, dressing, there's button hooks, zip grips, um, those fine motor things. There's always adaptive equipment to help. If you use elastic shoelaces, tie them once and they become slip-ons or use Velcro shoes, it's gonna be a lot um, easier and more science consuming um, than tying your shoes every single time. On the zip grip, they just attach to a zip zipper and then you're using like a finger or thumb to pull it up and down rather than a pinch. Um, another cheaper option would be to get some, you know, bulk key rings, um, just the metal key rings and put that on a zipper and leave it on there. And then it becomes just that little ring that you can use the same way. And um, adaptive clothing that has different ways to open, Velcro flies instead of zippers, all kinds of different resources out there. These are actually a pair of pants, the blue ones here, that we have in clinic and they are made for somebody that's pretty much in a wheelchair all the time and maybe using a patient lift so they're not having to get out. This is the back side. Um, so you see there's nothing there. So when they're in the wheelchair, they're completely covered and those flaps are kind of tucked in underneath. But then when they're needing to use the Hoyer, or use the restroom, those just come up and you don't have to worry about going up and down. If somebody's really focused on wanting to be fashionable but also have adaptive clothing, um, Tommy Hilfiger now has an entire line of adapted clothing. And these are a pair of jeans from Tommy Hilfiger that they look exactly like all the other jeans, but it's more of a magnetic um, closure instead of a zipper and then a Velcro. Nike makes some shoes that zip and then Velcro that are easier to put on and off. And then again, you don't have to tie. And these um, just are some side zip yoga pants that I saw on Etsy from doing a search. So there are a lot out there. I um, just wanted to provide a few resources. And then in the other areas, you know, again, that fine motor stuff, if you're using, like to do a lot of writing, um, some people still really love to write letters or cards, I think it's great. Um, but if, again, holding a smaller pen's harder, find a bigger pen, or this is a writing bird, that if you think more of a computer mouse in that shape that's bigger, it holds the pen, and then you're doing more of a gross grasp. Um, figure eight or oval eight finger splints you can see here. So if a finger is wanting to bend down and kind of gets in the way when you're typing or playing the piano, um, an occupational therapist can help um, either order those or make them for you. Doorknob adapters, again, if you turning's harder, it's gonna be easier just to kind of push a lever and do the same thing. 
key turners instead of that pinch, it's a gross grasp. And this is one of those, you know, as seen on TV sections of stores, a robo twist electric jar opener. So you put it on a jar, hit the button, and it opens it for you. And I'm actually, my mom has arthritis and I'm going to get her um, something similar like this or this one for um, a holiday coming up. So, you know, it, it doesn't, these can benefit many people. And there are some references. And I know, I, I know I flew through them for the sake of time. So I think we'll, I'll stop sharing so you can go back to questions. Thank you, Dr. Clegg. We do have some questions for all three of you. Um, Alicia, this one is geared towards you. There's a lot of talk about full fat dairy being better because of added sugar and um, it's low with fat or because it's low in fat or fat free varieties. What are your opinions on that? That goes under my, it depends. <laughs> okay. Um, I think it depends on the product. You know, I know that there have been some studies that came out recently in the last couple of years about um, does full fat dairy actually increase our risk for uh, heart disease? And what they found is that it does not. So um, if that being said, you know, there's no problem with choosing full fat dairy. I think it depends on what else is going on. If you're wanting to watch your calories a little bit. Sometimes they're a little lower in calories, sometimes not. But I think, you know, the there's a separate, you know, full fat dairy and added sugar. It would just depend on the product. But once again, probably choosing one that has less added sugar, you know, above everything is probably the best choice. Okay. And um, this person's saying that they use thickened drinks and it's difficult to get water. I currently water down my beverages. Any other options? All that and it, it made me pause because the whole point of using thickener to your water is to uh, thicken it up to a certain consistency so that you're not aspirating. Okay. Um, so so that that gives me pause and, and makes me think that you know if you're thickening, you have to thicken drinks, but you're thinning down your drinks and you're maybe not receiving the full benefit of actually thickening. Um, your beverages, but there are actually um, a lot of different recipes out there online. If you go to, if you use like Thicken Up or if you use the um, the other Thicken, um, you can go to their website and they have a lot of different recipes of blending that thickener with fruit and, and making it a little bit more palatable that way. Okay. And Dr. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Clegg, I know you'd mentioned that the, uh, you know, the the auto feeder bowl, you know, was so expensive. Um, does insurance cover any assisted devices? Not particularly that one, but um, you know, anything such as a handcuff or anything like that that um, people might be interested in purchasing? Typically not those lower, low tech adaptive equipment options. And um, they will usually pay for like a durable medical equipment like the shower chairs and the tub benches and those type of things sometimes, but even that can get tricky. Um, but those lower options, unfortunately, no. Okay. All right. Um, Selena, what is an AFO? It is an ankle foot orthosis. Okay. I guess I thought everyone knew that. I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> I forget what lingo I use, but it's uh, sometimes they're made of plastic. Sometimes they're made of a, a carbon composite type thing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they support at the back or the front of the lower part of the leg. Um, they not only stabilize the ankle, but if it's built well, it'll stabilize knees as well. And so mm -hmm. we really focus on how they need to be customized. If it's okay. off the shelf, it probably is not great. Okay. Amazon's got them, so be careful. Okay. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> That's a good point, because yeah. Amazon is a lot of people's go-to. Yeah. Um, we have a question, and I think it can relate to all three of you and all three of your um, professions. There's an old saying, use it or lose it, mm -hmm. and this phrase haunts this particular person. She um, is fairly new in her journey, but what tips could you give people that may be anxious about resting or, or loss of function? Uh, I guess I'll take that one to start with. Okay. You, there has to be knowledge and self-awareness of what the baseline is. If you feel mm -hmm. like you're regressing, see your doctor, see your therapist, um, if you feel it, it, to understand why. But so rest is important, but too much rest leads to sedentary lifestyle. So finding the balance, mm -hmm. you almost need mentorship to figure that out. Um, 
And then you should be able to figure it out on your own after that. I mean, some kind of guidance I think is important. Mm -hmm. Professional guidance is important because this neuromuscular disease is no small thing, of course. And, and finding that balance safely is where we need to start and then being checked at least every year. Sometimes we check people sooner than that if okay. we're concerned, but yeah. Okay, does anyone else have anything to add? I'll add, um, I agree completely with, with Selena thing it said, and I think it is finding that balance for you and everybody's gonna be different in that aspect. But, um, you know, if you're, for my sake, you know, we don't want you to become a couch potato, but I don't want you to spend all the energy and in taking a shower and getting dressed when you can use adaptive equipment or get help because then you're using that energy and that time that you save that way for something that's a whole lot more fun and meaningful to you. So it's, it's looking at it a little bit differently, but definitely don't want couch potatoes for sure. Mm -hmm. I, I do feel like it's important to say this because this comes up a whole lot in clinic is, is people really resist motorized wheelchairs. And I'm not talking about scooters. Scooters offer zero postural support and they're tippy. So be careful if you do. I mean, I don't, I'm not horrible against them, but just be really careful when you do something like that, because then you're stuck with it for a few years until insurance will do something else. So people get real resistant to that. And so what I tell people is, you know, park it in the garage, you know, make sure you don't lose your batteries, but um, as far as charge and all that kind of stuff, but find, we find measured times when you use that throughout the day, and but not all the time. But if, if uh, that just brought me to the memory, uh, you know, if, if you expend all your energy in the shower, you can't do anything else the rest of the day because you didn't want to use equipment, mm -hmm. you've kind of uh, done the wrong thing, I would say, or, or not the most optimal thing. People who use power chairs to get around at work come home and walk, and then they're able to play their roles of of parents, whatever, uh, that they do in the evenings. It allows them to be mobile all day, to spend parts of their time in power. Um, getting a power chair doesn't mean you're losing your ability to walk or anyone's giving up on your ability to walk. It's preserving it. It's quite the opposite. So don't, don't um, kind of listen to the advice and you get to pick what you wanna do, of course, but it can be a huge help to not be exhausted all day long just because you didn't want to go that route. That's a great point. Great advice. And um, a couple more questions and then we're going to move on to our next session. But is it best to recommend a physical therapist through an MDA clinic for patients or your GP? And this person is asking, you know, how do they go about finding a PT or OT that specializes in neuromuscular therapy? If, if you go to APTA.org, it's American Physical Therapy Association.org, you can look up anybody's license. So if you have somebody's name, you can look up the license, you can look up uh, more of their certifications, but really the easiest way is ask your doctor who they prefer. Uh, we tend to have relationships with each other. I have my, my most trusty OT friends and speech pathology friends and trusty neurologists and sometimes my favorite neurologist and maybe not someone else's favorite but we have a network and so tap into your doctor's network and uh, also look on their on their card their business card in the clinic because every clinician has some sort of board certified specialty and if they don't maybe they have years of experience so you can ask your therapist we won't be offended if you say are you board certified i had someone with multiple sclerosis wanted to know if i was board certified in ms specifically i'm like well in neurology yes <laughs> but, um, and i understand i want i would want that for my child for my spouse and so i it, tap into your physician to get that information okay i would say and I, I know I see Dr. Sanka is still on the line. I don't know if she stepped away from a moment, but I'm gonna pose this question um, to the panel, but also to Dr. Sanka if she is available. How important I'm is here. Okay, how important is exercise to help with gains received from older SMA patient taking spinraza? Um, so I'll, I'll take a first part of it and see if Selena wants to add a, a little bit more. Um, I don't have my video on, but I apologize. So, um, okay. so I think um, when we are treating uh, patients with any newer medication, we do 
want them to stay active because um, sometimes we do achieve some improvement in functionality, though we don't see a lot of improvement in strength. So there's an improvement in strength and there's improvement in functionality. And um, if they keep active uh, with what they have, um, either whether it is passive range of motions or active with some exercises um, that helps um, along with the medication. Um, it's all just not the medication. It's a combination of medication plus rehabilitation. I think the rehabilitation makes your medications work better um, and you'll be able to gain some of the activities that your body has forgotten how to do because it's, it's improving its functionality. The muscles are getting better and you can train to do them make them do much more better. So Selena, do you want to add anything more? Yes, I think um, people are pleasantly surprised when they see improvement when all they've seen is decay of function and then they start to see improvement. I think the first part of that is of the improvement that we see is getting uh, on the other side of being too sedentary. And so they see improvements because they're in better shape. They finally found where they at least ought to be at the very least. But then when they get improvements, we, we know medications are working. We know that other interventions are working. And honestly, insurance is more willing to pay to continue to pay for those medications when they see improvement overall. I tend to write therapy goals more related to function than muscle strength grades because Dr. Sank is completely correct. We may not have enough strength to shift from one grade to the next grade to show improvement, but there's efficiencies that they learn and ways of doing things and using assistive devices like Dr. Clegg was talking about that makes functionality better that then um, justifies why, why activities are even necessary and, it, and it'll fund therapies that way as well. Not just medications, but therapies. It's very true. Well, I, we don't have anything else that have popped in. So thank you very much, everyone, for your time today. I appreciate all your presentations and for being here today. Thank you.